Mark, we are recording, so I'm going to go ahead and mute and let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. Our discussion about before outsiders, apologetics in every course across curricula and for life. Uh, just one uh, baseline housekeeping idea. We'd love to have Q&A at the end of this particular presentation. And if you want, would like to utilize the chat box for that in the Zoom area, feel free to do that. I'm not going to see it, but others will uh, manage that chat box and uh, give us those uh, questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and just one other comment, and that is that um, outside of uh, my general response to scripture, my whole focus here today is to highlight uh, methods and stories and examples uh, for the public university. But the phrase before outsiders is one of those phrases that's used in uh, Second Testament, New Testament uh, teaching. And that is that our responsibility before those who are not believers uh, is crucial. So I'm thinking about Colossians 4, 5, and 6, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and 12, um, really many huge chapters in 1 Peter, including chapter 2, 11 to 17. So there are lots of uh, passages here that we could go to, but uh, for our purposes today, I wanted to make sure uh, from one college prof uh, to a whole bunch of others uh, that we are going to really focus on our responsibilities as Christians in the public university. So my interest in uh, highlighting uh, these kinds of ideas is to uh, give you lots of examples. So let me begin with this one. I was teaching a course uh, uh, entitled Reading, Writing, and Inquiry. And one of the young women in my uh, course, a lesbian, uh, had written a number of papers in the course on uh, her concerns for the LGBTQ plus movement. And uh, of course, I read all of the drafts and those kinds of things. And in this particular paper, she was actually supposed to take positions that were outside of her own position, that is positions that were contrary to her own, uh, to address them, as I've always taught uh, students that to choose the best arguments from another side and then deal with them uh, effectively in your own paper is a great way to uh, identify issues and, and problems and then, of course, respond to them. In a sense, uh, produce an apologetic for your own view. Uh, when I went to her and ha had this discussion in class, as I normally would, as we would have in-class uh, conversations, I just uh, suggested, since she was doing uh, an anti-conversion therapy paper uh, against conversion of homosexuality, I said, you know, very interesting that I just this morning read two articles uh, that were contrary to the position that you're taking. Uh, I'll be happy to send them to you. There was a long pause. And then she slowly shook her head side to side. Now, remember, that was part of the assignment. I wasn't uh, trying to press her into anything. It was just simply an issue of how she was supposed to do the paper. What was fascinating about this, and of course, I responded to all of this on the paper and the final draft. But at the end of the course, when she did her final reflection, one of the things she said was, I actually learned how I'm not listening to other people and I need to do a more effective job of hearing those who don't agree with my positions. My view in the public university uh, in terms of education is that my philosophy is one of ownership. So I'm trying to get students to own their beliefs. Whatever their belief may be, I want them to own it. And I believe that the best way to attain that ownership is by writing, actually. I think writing is the best way to own anything. So. I will always say to my students, my job is not to teach you what to think, but how to think. And that ultimately is my job uh, as an apologist, literally, uh, in the public university. So past that story, let me suggest where we're going to go here this afternoon. Um, I wanted to suggest that apologetics, in my mind, runs through all curricula. So every discipline, every study, every class, actually, is defending whatever it is that they believe. So I'm going to be offering stories as we go, uh, tell you stories like the one I just mentioned, uh, give you examples of ways that I actually utilize some of my thinking in the public classroom. 
And then I want to suggest methods. So for instance, here is one uh, just on the screen, compare and contrast method. Uh, I tell people all the time, I think it's the most powerful educational tool because you literally can set two uh, points of view up side by side and see them and then have them uh, have those two opposing views actually collaborate or uh, interact with the concept of whatever the idea is that they're after. But I think that method is important and I'll be sharing some other methods. Obviously, this is a public university presentation. I teach at the university uh, here in Indianapolis, IUPUI. And I also suggest just at the outset that my view of educating in the public university is that I uh, view my job as one of sharing transcendent and universal principles and only without chapter and verse. So whenever anybody would ask me, well, how, how is it different for you as a Christian in the university? That's what I tell them. I'm teaching universal principles uh, from my view that come from God. I just never say anything like that. And certainly uh, without a scriptural identification afterwards. So those are the kinds of ideas that we'll be after here this afternoon. So here's actually a picture of a class, all back to the head so nobody can be seen. And I will say this phrase all of the time in every class. I just said it again yesterday as I was on campus. Uh, you'll use these kinds of concepts, these principles for the rest of your lives. So my job is to help students to understand the knowledge that they're gaining, the interpretation of the knowledge, the methodologies that they're going to utilize as they engage whatever information they're after. And then, of course, I'm exposing my students to readings and questions and concerns uh, that, quite frankly, they're not going to hear any other place on campus. Uh, so I choose things very deliberately, not like everybody else is choosing. So I actually get to control all of those things in my own curriculum. So much so that I actually have students come to me on a regular basis. This happens, I would, I would say, almost weekly. And I'm only associate faculty. So, you know, that's a fancy word we use at IUPUI for adjunct. Um, but I'm associate faculty, but I would say once a week, I have students email, text, uh, write, call, uh, send me uh, something and say, hey, can we get together and talk? Uh, actually, I've got a couple of those this afternoon uh, from folks uh, who have been students in the past. So I do think that this is beneficial. And I do think that uh, this apologetic viewpoint actually runs past the course that we teach itself. One of the courses that I'm teaching this semester is entitled Argumentative Writing. And I'm actually introducing my students to uh, a model that I developed back in 2004 when I was teaching at Moody Bible Institute. I've actually used this model uh, in high school and undergrad and also in PhD work. It's a very simple model. We spell claim with a K and you see all of the uh, words on the screen there, knowledge, limitations, authority, interpretation, and mindset. Now, what I do is actually give a short, uh, what I call teaching burst uh, of three to four minute videos on each one of those. So I kind of elucidate what they mean. I actually do it in front of a whiteboard here at my house and we create the videos. I suggest all of that to say that the model is, is quite elaborate and uh, I could do a whole presentation just on that model. Uh, and in fact, take perhaps even a class, a whole course uh, to teach the model. But I, I suggest it here for us because I think these basic ideas are true for every discipline. All of us have knowledge, a source of knowledge. We all see limitations in our disciplines. We all have an authority base. We interpret our discipline in a certain way. And then it creates in us a certain disposition and attitude of mindset. And I think those things are important. Something else I discover as I read, and I'm constantly reading in lots of different arenas, is the idea that um, there are people that even within their own disciplines aren't sure that their own disciplines are doing things right. So uh, not only did I do a, uh, a video on this for the public, I'll mention that in a few moments, but I also put together a small discussion uh, board for this argumentative writing class where I use this piece from The Atlantic from last year, uh, where uh, Ed Young, who is the science uh, editor for The Atlantic, wrote these words, sometimes researchers selectively publish positive results while sweeping negative ones under the rug. Other times they futz with their data 
until they get something interesting or retrofit their questions to match their answers. Now, one of my uh, students has actually thought that it would be a good idea if we created t-shirts that said, uh, we don't futz with the data. Uh, when I mentioned that to my wife, she vetoed that immediately. I can hear you all laughing uproariously, I'm sure. My point in suggesting this is that when you find a scientist who admits things like this, I think that's pretty powerful. And it at least gives students pause. It makes them think, where is this information coming from and what's the uh, reliability for it, the verifiability, the credibility, all of those kinds of trust issues. One of the things that's true at our campus is that I've actually had an opportunity to be invested in, in committees, even as associate faculty. So one of the things that they've wanted to do at IUPUI is create more of an interdisciplinary mindset. And so we would sit around, uh, this was all before COVID, uh, for a couple of meetings, three meetings, as I recall, and we were talking about how do we uh, see this interplay, this integration between the sciences and other disciplines. And some of us were highlighting uh, the work of Gothic horror readings, so that we're actually investing Gothic horror readings in science classes. Now, I've actually taught a whole course on Gothic horror literature. It's one of my favorite courses to teach. And the reason why it's a favorite course is because all of those uh, famous books are morality plays. And I believe that in every situation that we're in, I think it's really valuable to find literature that helps our students uh, to breach the ethics that we might end up preaching otherwise. So I believe in breaching rather than preaching. And so literature does that. Every course that I teach in MA and PhD, for instance, levels, uh, I actually uh, ask my students to read a novel. So the novel, of course, coinciding with whatever the subject area is that we're engaging. But it, again, a, a thought for us to consider. For those of you invested in math, here is just something to consider. Uh, predictable patterns in creation. Again, I have emphasized the fact that I talk about universal transcendent truth. Uh, and I talk about these kinds of things, that mathematicians and scientists rely on a stable universe, that order establishes logic, logic constitutes pattern, pattern produces models, models make possible determinations of probability, determinations of probability allow for prediction, prediction predicates hypothesis, hypothesis suggests proof, and a proof can show truth. And so we, even within the maths, I think it's really important for us to identify these transcendent universal principles that we can make these concepts from. Uh, we're not making them, we're simply discovering them and sharing them with our students. But I do think they're valuable. Uh, the kinds of ideas I think that take students deeper into the subjects that we're actually studying. Uh, I mentioned that I'm associate faculty at IUPUI. One of the reasons is because I went back to school again but when I went back to school again, I had to get a degree in the field that I wanted to teach in. Of course, we all know that. And so because I'm a humanities person, uh, I went back to the English courses and started taking lit courses. One of the courses I took was a literature course on the Civil War uh, from the brilliant historian Jane Schultz. In fact, I was able to take the final course she taught at IUPUI just before she retired. She's actually been invested in lots of television programming on PBS and things like this. Well, uh, our final project was that we had to pick a subject and our subject had to coincide with some of the things that we had learned in the class. And so two of the uh, people that we were reading in the class were Frederick Douglass and Angelina Grimke. Grimke was one of uh, white abolitionists, obviously Frederick Douglass, black, a former slave. And what I suggested to my prof was I said, you know, it'd be really interesting since all of their writings were based on the Bible. If I could go back and establish a theological foundation for the abolitionist movement. And so she accepted that proposition and I was able then to produce the paper. I suggest this as a possibility uh, to see history as a way in to discuss Christianity. And I, I'm even thinking about the sciences and the maths, even as I'm uh, speaking these words, uh, because when I think about the famous Michael Faraday, for instance, Michael Faraday was the only picture that Einstein had hanging in his office. So who was Michael Faraday? Well, if you actually expose students to him, 
they'll discover that he was a Christian and uh, he had tremendous development within uh, the, the whole field of electricity. I believe history is a way in to discuss points of view that would get after uh, Christian truths. One of the things that's encouraged at our university, of course, as it is in, true in every university, is that we highlight diversity issues. Well, instead of the normal diversity issues, I chose neurodiversity. And one of the reasons was because I was reading an HBR article, that's Harvard Business Review, and it actually said that uh, some of the military organizations around the world uh, we're hiring people with neurodiverse abilities. Uh, and we're thinking here about those folks who might be highly autistic, for instance, just as a, a for instance. So I chose this article and I had my students begin to write on this aspect of diversity. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, they were just energized and excited by the whole thing. Uh, I heard their stories. They wrote these wonderful pieces uh, that talked about their anguish in their own family over this. And I point this out only to suggest that I think that even the assessments we create can point people to truth. So I had multiple opportunities. Again, way too many stories to tell for a presentation like this. Multiple opportunities to engage young people uh, with lives and questions and tears, I might add, as we uh, spoke privately about some of the issues they were facing, all because I had chosen an assessment tool that got into an issue that got deeper than the normal kinds of things that we usually do in university. So I would suggest that assessment processes are also an important uh, tool for us to utilize. Speaking of which, um, as I suggested or mentioned already, I'm teaching a course on argumentative writing. And my text for this course is this movie. So I told my students ahead of the course that they had to purchase this film because they'd be watching it at least three times. Now there's lots of reasons for this and I could go into all of the details behind each of the assessments, but notice what's here on the screen. Bong Joon-ho is very specific in his interviews that he's telling an emotional story, he's presenting evidence for his belief about classism throughout the movie. So I developed this assignment that would get them uh, understanding these baseline ideas about proof and corroboration and psychology and change and so on, but always seen through the lens of this particular film. And there are tremendous opportunities for engagement, again, with these transcendent universal principles. You'll notice the title of this slide is Controlling Class Content. So I have the opportunity to do that. And when I do that, I actually choose things that, that will take us further than what uh, other classes might do in, t in, the terms, in terms of transcendent uh, thought. One of the organizations that I uh, belong to is called the Heterodox Academy. So if you go to their website and you look up all of the members, you'll find me in there. Uh, the reason I mention this is because I was even showing this three minute video even yesterday in a course I was teaching on the university campus. And it's entitled Viewpoint Diversity. You can go uh, to YouTube and look up Heterodox Academy Viewpoint Diversity, it'll pop up. It's a little three minute video. And my point in suggesting this, of course, is that I'm trying to get students to view other points of view other than the one they normally hear. And so my students on campus got an earful from me yesterday about uh, when we were talking about the great influencers of life. That's a whole nother discussion. I think there are five major ones. I was talking about universities and I said, who do you think is controlling this classroom? And of course they all smiled through their masks and said it was me. And I said, of course. So it matters who your professors are. So it actually matters that you get different points of view than the professors you have. And so we took that on as, as a discussion point. My point in bringing this up is not only do colleagues appreciate your participation in outside organizations, but you can present these things to students in ways that engage thought further than what the class would normally do. And perhaps you've heard of Jonathan Haidt and his, uh, many of his books, he's written a lot of different things, one of which is The Coddling of the American Mind. Another thing that's important, I think, for us, and this goes along with uh, outside organizations, but that is community development. So we're always interested as college professors of showing students how the subjects that we're studying relate to the life that they're going to be living. So I introduced a, a class, for instance, to Dolores Kennedy from the Central Indiana Realtist Association. I bring this up because in 1947, 
uh, African Americans could not be called real accords. They were forbidden. And so they created their own organization called Realitis. It still exists today. So we've had Dolores Kennedy on a radio show we have, and uh, Dolores invited me to, to present the prayer at, at her big luncheon that she had this last year. I mention this again because I think that anytime we can get students and faculty to recognize what we're doing outside the classroom with other organizations that actually deal with things that we deal with in the university, like the title of this slide, Socioeconomic Equality, anytime we can do that, and we do it with uh, Christian leaders in the community, oh, that's huge. And of course, Dolor Dolores is, and uh, it's a great organization, and I highly recommend uh, even just taking a look at the kind of work that they do. Uh, another essay, another assignment that I gave uh, students actually this week was on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And notice the, the slide in italics underlined. I cannot tell you how many times when I'm teaching and especially having conversations with faculty and we will have huge disagreements about where the source or origin of anything comes from. So just take something like the huge issue of ethics, for instance. Uh, we will always agree to disagree on where this comes from, but we will always agree on the consequences of the ends. This is what we hope to happen in the future. So I'm always talking about those two words because those two words really are the bookends to every uh, discussion in any discipline. Where does this come from? What's the source of whatever it is that we're studying? And once we participate in it, what will be the consequence of this? So you'll notice here on the slide, uh, this issue of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As soon as we begin to talk about this, the very first line talks about the word should. <laughs> Well, as soon as you say the word should, you're demanding a standard for right and wrong. You're actually acceding to a viewpoint that says, I know what's right and wrong. So even the second statement in uh, the Universal Declaration says that we ought to care for other people. Well, my first question is, why should I do that? Who says? What authority base do we have for any of those? So once again, controlling the curriculum, controlling what my students actually see in the classroom, asking them then to do assessment processes that get them thinking about these kinds of, quite frankly, eternal issues. So the real issues, we tend to assume oughts and shoulds. We really don't spend much time in humanities discussing the source, unfortunately. So I actually press the point. And I press the point because I think it's important that students recognize that if we're going to talk about the humanities, we need to talk about religion. We need to talk at least about the billions of people who are Christians and Muslims and Jews in the world, because those are three huge groups. So what are we going to do with those folks? Because they think might think quite differently than the rest of us. I believe belief leads to consequence. So here's a really short uh, process. I've used this little uh, engagement method in lots of different ways. Uh, what is the worldview, the underlying assumption of whatever somebody might be believing? and then suggest who's the proponent of this, the major contributor, and then the policies that come from this, and how do the governments respond, and then ultimately the consequences. What was the result of this? Often, if I'm talking in historic terms, I talk about the issue of totalitarianism, uh, and you can pick a stripe of that. In more recent days, in the last few months, we've noticed that even Margaret Sanger is uh, being questioned now as the great authority of Planned Parenthood. Uh, people are wanting to press her to the background now because of course she was a racist and uh, all of the kinds of things I think that happen once you understand somebody's assumption and then ultimately where does it lead is a really great methodology of getting students to help them and understand where do these things lead us. Here's just a couple of slides that connect again with uh, the sciences. Um, I'm really interested in this whole topic of biomimicry. And what's really fascinating, if you look at this little bug here on, this, on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, scientists have actually been developing uh, aspects of life that they can put on the sides and roofs of buildings, let's say in places like New Mexico and Arizona, because these bugs actually accumulate the water from an overnight dew in the desert. 
and that water then is what sustains them. Well, actually, what we're doing is mimicking what we see in the creational world around us by creating the same kind of material that we actually utilize now on places like roofs of buildings so that we can, uh, let's say, for instance, water the lawn of whatever building it is that's sitting on that property. Here's just another example of this, a planetarium in Spain, all based on the human eye. So whatever we see in nature and, and creation around us, we're really focused on how do we, uh, again, see that design? Where does that come from? Uh, why do we see order and meaning in the universe? And of course, we can have a great discussion about any of those issues. I believe in reading outside of my own field. Here's just a few books in the last year. Uh, the Maker of Patterns, for instance, Freeman Dyson, uh, really got me interested in his book when I started reading some of his letters. He was uh, quite a prodigious scholar from his 50s into his 90s, just before he died this last year. Uh, great scientist, questioned everything, uh, even questioned climate change issues. And in fact, Freeman Dyson said that what scientists ought to be concerned about are practical issues like feeding people who, can't, who don't have enough food. Imagine that. Uh, I've been invested, uh, as I've already mentioned, in neurodiversity, so I was reading Temple Grandin. And then uh, Sharon Dirks is a, a Christian scientist who's actually done some great work in brain research. I'm just suggesting these books as uh, perhaps some examples of ways that we can read outside of our own fields to not only expand our own horizons, but see how those connections can be made for apologetics across disciplines. I believe it's important that we show up for other people's presentations. So uh, one of the places that I was invested in for a semester was the Flannery House, which has a, a century old plus uh, connection to, it, to the Indianapolis area, but really uh, throughout politics and especially in the black community for the last 100 years, very famous people have come to Indianapolis because of the Flannery House. I've been to presentations by professors who are dealing with teaching methods or equality diversity issues. I mention this because I think it's important that if we want people to show up for our stuff, we should show up for theirs. Uh, there, there ought to be a, a collaborative camaraderie that happens as we actually participate in the lives of other people. One of the things that's really important to me, one of the centerpieces for my focus is the Ray Bradbury Center. It is the only place on the planet, and I emphasize that, on the planet, that all of Ray Bradbury's uh, writings and anything that he had in his possession was actually given to IUPUI. Uh, John Eller was a very close friend of Ray Bradbury. Just for those of you who may not remember, Ray was the one who wrote the book Fahrenheit 451, very famous book. So, we have those kinds of things available to us. I think we should zero in on some of the opportunities we might have to speak into those areas and then to be invited to invest in them as well. So I mentioned I've gone back to school again. I've got a degree in the area that I think is important for me to get in. Uh, and I was just rethinking this verse this morning, uh, Titus 3, 2, uh, that says, do whatever is good, slander no one, be peaceable, considerate, show true humility toward all men. And I'm really taken by those uh, bookends of that verse, no one and all men. The point of the verse and the emphasis that I want to suggest here is that our doing good should be to everybody all the, way, all the time, wherever we are. So we should develop friendships uh, within our community of academics. And I'm sure that you all are doing this. But I really think that it's important and powerful for us because it allows us doorways, entryways, uh, into our apologetic work when we're friends with people in the academic community. Uh, like most profs in most, most places, uh, they care about three things at IEPUI. They care, care first of all, of course, about degrees. Uh, secondly, close second, I would, I would say is publishing and then teaching. I mentioned that Civil War course uh, a bit ago. Actually, my final project uh, became a peer reviewed journal article that appeared in the journal. I emailed my professor months after the course had, had ended and told her that it was being published. And she immediately wrote back and said, this is the best news that she'd heard in months. You see, my professor, not a believer, uh, somebody who was pr quite liberally progressive, uh, she knew where I was coming from as well. 
but at the same time, what did she esteem? She esteemed the publishing. What did that say to her about me and any kind of engagement we may have? I believe that what she thought is most important, like publishing, is something I was doing. I share that with her. That grows the opportunity for esteem, I believe, in the, in the academy. Here's another example of some of the things we're talking about here. Uh, of course, this is uh, front page news right now. If nobody knows what originalism has been or was or is, uh, they can look that up pretty easily right now uh, when we're talking about the Constitution of the United States, or I might add any kind of text or reading. I don't like to use the word text, but it's what the university uses. They want to eliminate any kind of emphasis on author. Because as soon as you say the word author, now you have to begin to deal with authorial and then authorial intent and ultimately authority. And because uh, people aren't really too uh, happy about having authority, especially from somebody in literature that's telling them what they ought to do, uh, this is something of course that goes and cuts against the grain for most folks. I actually took a course at IUPUI where I was defending E.D. Hirsch's uh, 1967 PhD work, uh, The Validity of Interpretation, uh, where he was subscribing to authorial intent. And I finished my presentation and my professor, who was about as far from me as the screen is right now, uh, looked at me square in the eye and he said, do you really believe that? Of course, he believed in reader response theory, which is we get to determine whatever we wanted to say. I smiled at him and said, yes, sir, I do. Now, of course, you know, at that time I was uh, about 60 and I didn't really care, uh, quite frankly, uh, that I was cutting against the grain of the university because I believed what I believed. And I believe it because it's the doctrine within me that makes it so. Uh, I believe in authority. I believe in authorial intent. And I believe that when somebody writes something, it means something to them. And therefore, I should establish my viewpoint of, let's say, jurisprudence in this case about the Constitution in ways that uh, actually subscribe to an originalist theory. Here's just another example of method. Uh, I honestly think that part of my responsibility is getting students ready for what they're about to do. So a course I taught last semester was actually in the science building. And I was telling my students, I just kind of erupt from time to time, you know, and I was telling my students who are writing these essays, I said, you know, you're surrounded right now by scientists, but scientists really need you. Scientists need people to tell their stories. They need people who can write and explain and, and give the narrative of all of the numerical emphasis that scientists are pouring out. So I suggest these ideas here about need, why is your vocation necessary? And we're helping students to forecast where they're going into the future with the studies that they're doing. What's the outcome? What do you expect to accomplish? The content, what's necessary to know? The community, who will be impacted by what you do? When and where will your vocation have impact? And then the methods, how will you communicate your vocational ideas? All of these things in one way or another wrap around the concept of we're made for something. Well, why are we made for something? What gives meaning and purpose to life? Uh, and then we can actually talk about those kinds of things because why it's arisen out of our curricula. If anything arises out of the curricula, it's free and open for discussion. And these are the kinds of things I'm trying to put forward here today as, as possibilities of thoughtfulness toward uh, what we might uh, think about into the future as we teach our classes apologetics across the curriculum. Here are, uh, just as I kind of wind down here, professors and students all assume basic things. They believe in a, an origin for our study. Where did that come from? We believe in boundaries. Why are the limitations built into the world? We believe in exploration. What else is there to learn? We delight as we pursue other opportunities. How can I make this better? And then ultimately, a lack of fulfillment in our discoveries. When will I feel satisfied? I could tell you stories again about not only the faculty I've spoken with, but students who have heard faculty say, you know, I've, I've reached these zeniths in my career, but I'm unsatisfied. What else is there? They've actually heard these statements from college professors. So I think these kinds of ideas, again, give us a way in, questions to ask students uh, as they begin to think differently about uh, the kinds of world 
uh, or the kind of world that they're entering, and of course, how they then will enter the world. And we're asking them to address issues without chapter and verse, but come from another place outside of them. And this is what we're uh, trying to help uh, people to understand. I believe all of life rests on two basic pillars. I believe in absolute truth and the inherent corruption of humanity. I believe that all of life comes down to what do you believe about human nature? Is it perfectible? Are we getting better and better? Or on the other hand, are we inherently corrupt? Or is, are both true at the same time? Do we have both dignity and depravity within us? And if that's true, then what does that mean for human life? And, and should we go about protecting human life? And what about issues of justice and all of the kind of things that come from that? And then of course, we run up against this issue of authority or truth and we say, well, how, do we can, how can we know truth? Well, I think that runs through every discipline as well because every single discipline starts with an assumption about whatever it is they study. Every single discipline does this. Every single person does this. So we're all assuming something all the time. And I think it's powerful that we get after these two pillars and find ways that uh, we can address these kinds of things apologetically within our courses. Uh, certainly we see theology driving sociology, at least it should, uh, that because of structure and order, we have uh, all of the rest of this righteousness and justice and peace and hope. And theology should drive our sociology, not the other way around. I'm not an Americanized Christianity, nor should we uh, be beholden to a cultural Christianity, uh, but that we should view all things through the lens of Scripture, and that Scripture and biblical theology should drive what we think and how we then should teach. So when it comes to things like, let's say, for instance, child abuse or human trafficking, the only way that evil men are stopped is when good people do something. And this is a very difficult thing for, for all of us, I think, to even look at and say, human trafficking, child abuse, these are awful things. Well, guess what? Even the people that we work with agree with us on this. And so where would we begin a discussion? I think we should begin a discussion with the baseline question, why is this even wrong? In a world that where we have the Jeffrey Epstein's of the world, why, why is this even wrong? And why is it that uh, somebody is put in prison because uh, it, it's been found out that they're a pedophile? I mean, all of these things are really baseline ideas that allow us a further conversation and larger discussion about issues and things that I think are really powerful and important. And of course, we can address them from a biblical point of view, as I'm suggesting here. I could tell you lots of stories about lots of uh, students and conversations I've had with the faculty. I, had a, I sat in a faculty person's office for two hours, and I'm talking eye to eye, face to face, and this whole discussion ended in tears, and they weren't mine. Those kinds of things can happen on the university campus when we give ourselves uh, to the work of apologetics, which invests our, our lives in other people. I'll never forget a young man who came to me after the first month or so of class, and he said, you know why I chose you as a professor? I said, no, I have no idea. He said, well, I had a choice between you and somebody who ranked 2.5 on rate your professor out of five. He said, I thought I'd take a shot with a Christian theologian. <laughs> what happens is that my students Google me, and because I'm all over social media, uh, everybody can see what I think and believe about everything. And so uh, that's what he said. I Googled you and I found out who you were. And, and that was his comment. I thought I'd take a shot with this. Uh, let me suggest this story, though, as I kind of finish this slide and, and the presentation. I'll never forget this young man. He was uh, a junior in his uh, second semester junior. He had already been at IU, a brilliant researcher. He was, had been working at IU in scientific research for three years already since his freshman year. And he told me in conversations that we had had outside of class, a couple of them, he is, he's a, a agnostic. And he said to me, uh, you know, I don't believe in any of these kinds of things, but I'm fascinated by the fact that you do. So we'd have these long running conversations. So at the end of class, the very last class, where we all kind of get together and, you know, college props bring food and they tell stories and things like this. Well, that's what I did. And this young man, he waited till everybody else was gone. And he turned around, his back was to me. Forgive me, this always chokes me up. 
his back was to me and he turned around and tears coming down his cheeks. And he said to me, he said, I didn't know that a class like this would, would impact me the way it has. He said, I'll never forget what you taught. I'll never forget you. And I'll never forget the kind of thinking that I had to do in this class that nobody has ever asked me to do ever before. That's our possibility. That's our responsibility. As Christians within the university, whatever it is that we teach, uh, that we have the opportunity to engage uh, faculty and students in this way. So here are some ways that you can get a hold of me if you're interested, see some of the things that I've worked on and done. We have a, a video that comes out every uh, Tuesday. It's called Truth and Two. You can find me all over social media. Here are some of the places uh, that I'm suggesting here. Uh, and of course, some of what I've suggested here today, I would love it if you would actually purchase this book. It's uh, a multidisciplinary tribute to David Noggle, Dallas Baptist University uh, famed worldview professor uh, down there in Texas. And we, uh, I was asked to put this essay in this book. And so uh, I highly recommend it, not because of what I've said necessarily, but because there's a tremendous tribute from all kinds of different disciplines for David Noggle and the kind of good work that he's done throughout his career. So uh, that ends my presentation. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left and uh, we have uh, the possibility, I think, for some opportunity for questions. Perhaps you've submitted them uh, via chat, but I will let uh, Andy make the opportunity available now to make some of those known or perhaps others who would actually like to be unmuted and uh, ask some questions if anybody has them. I got a question just on this on this page. What is warpandwoof.org? That's my personal website. So warp and woof are vertical horizontal threads that make up fabric. And so because I'm Colossians 117 guy, by him, by Jesus, are all things held together. The warp and woof of the whole world is held together in coherence by the Lord. We don't have any questions in the chat, so if you would like to ask a question, just uh, please unmute your mic and fire away, or if you have any comments. Um, yes, um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, this is Richard. Um, I just was intrigued by your opening example uh, in in which you were um, working with the young lady that was um, affirming the LGBTQ perspective. Um, it's kind of interesting with our cancel culture that we have these days and uh, a reluctance in some campuses to even allow a, uh, a viewpoint that doesn't line up with uh, maybe the majority viewpoint to uh, speak on campus. Uh, do you have any comments about that? Yes. Uh, so it's all in how you design the project. It's all in how you design the assignment. So if I design an assignment that says you have to, if you're going to write about whatever, and I don't care what you write about, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you want to write about this, then you have to find alternative or divergent distinctive sources that are outside of your viewpoint. That's just part of the assignment. So if you decide that you want to take on uh, the issue of uh, some kind of conformity therapy that some people think that you can, uh, some Christian groups do this, the old Exodus group did this, and you want to take that on, great. I'll be happy to read whatever you write, but don't forget, part of your assignment is that you have to get people that don't agree with you and you have to come up with reputable sources. And I think that's really uh, the power in it once you create the assignment and they step in that water, it's all on them then. It's not, doesn't have anything to do with me. We do have a comment in the chat and I can just read you the comment, Mark. It says, as a librarian, I appreciate your emphasis 
on exposing students to a wide variety of information and data resources to expand their perspectives on subjects in classes. Great, absolutely agree with that and try to live it. Other questions or comments? Art, this is Steve Adams. I teach in the veterinary school, which is a very technologically driven area. I teach a lot of skills. I don't teach a lot of classes where it's a discussion. How do I bring my faith in? in what, what kind of suggestions do you have to bring my faith in? Because I don't really engage students on philo philosophical discussions ever. I mean, one example, small example that I use is somebody asks, why is this, why is this anatomy like it is? And my answer is it was designed that way. I don't go much farther, but do you have any suggestions for people in the technical fields? So I'm assuming by your question, as you uh, suggest skills, uh, you're talking about uh, people who will be doing technological still skills for the rest of their lives. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I would honestly uh, start with character qualities. Uh, all skills need to be driven by shoulds and oughts. So why should you, and you know, you can fill in the blank on this, why should you treat, let's say, a cadaver humanely? if you are uh, actually after that kind of uh, science? Or why as a veterinarian uh, should you treat uh, animals this way? Uh, as developing skills, I think, begins with these character issues that actually have their origin in ethics and that ultimately have an opportunity then to, to give you the origin sources uh, possibility. So I do believe that getting along with people for the rest of your life, for instance, uh, would be an opportunity to teach relational connections uh, with other human beings. And I think, of course, scripture is full of that. Just the book of Proverbs. If you would bring in, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, I'm thinking here about Proverbs chapter 27, which actually has a long uh, list of proverbial statements about how to handle your livestock and how to treat um, the property that you own. Uh, I'm, and I'm thinking now about all of what the Pentateuch says in places like Deuteronomy 20 to 25 or Leviticus 19 to 24. Um, there are tremendous passages here that talk about our responsibility to the things that we've been given. So even if you discuss the issues of stewardship, uh, how is it important that you must maintain your skill throughout the rest of your career? Uh, every three years, you have to go and do some new educational process. Well, why is that? Uh, why is it important to learn new things? I mean, I could go on and on here, but I think you get the point that I do think that we can uh, teach these kinds of baseline character ideas right straight out of scripture without chapter and verse. Thank you. Yeah, I, let me comment on that also. Uh, you reminded me that I have a colleague that teaches a safety course, and I know one of the uh, talks that he gives, he uses uh, a proverb, uh, something like, uh, you can prepare a horse for battle, but uh, it comes from the Lord or something like that. But uh, he uses that as a starting point for some discussion. Uh, and certainly in the safety area, there's a lot of, of um, you know, random events can can really affect you uh, very negatively. So uh, I think that's an example of how, uh, as you said, Proverbs could be used. I, that's great, Richard. I appreciate that. I, it, it makes me smile because just the other day I created an assignment where I was uh, having my students read Sun Tzu and Solomon at the same time in the same assignment, uh, mm -hmm. The Art of War and the Book of Proverbs. Because the baseline ideas of how to get along with people, let's say, for instance, if you're having an argument or not having one, but making one, is how do you approach uh, a person who, is, uh, who refuses to back down? And what is your approach to that? So I actually utilized uh, Chinese and Hebraic wisdom in the same assignment. Mark, um, I have a, a question. So I'm a math professor, 
And so I, it's kind of the same sort of question that was asked before about technical fields. You know, I don't, I don't do a lot of discussion stuff in my classes. I do a lot of lecturing about this is the way to do this math. This is the way to solve these problems and stuff. But I have thought some, uh, you know, a decent amount about some sort of, you know, philosophical ends with Christianity. There's a wonderful essay called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. <laughs> have you ever read that no. essay? It's, uh, it's brilliant. And uh, it's written by a guy who was an atheist. Uh, but in, in the essay, I mean, he comes right up to, <laughs> uh, and then he walks away. He turns around the other way. But so there's things like that that are that are great inroads, and uh, you know other things. Sometimes I'll just mention I teach probability, and I'll mention very in passing on the very first day of class that I don't I don't believe in chance. Uh, that probability is just a model; it's not reality. Um, so those are some some inroads and stuff. But you know, I guess like especially thinking about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, or some of the other things that, like you talked about in your. Um, in your slides about the, um, I can't remember what you what you even said about math, but you had the one slide about how uh, I don't know logic and I reason. I we'll see that slide again too. I don't know if you can go back to it. So, I guess my question is, yeah, 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 patterns. Yeah, I, I I've thought about this a bunch about how uh, this is very similar to the um, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics type stuff. But um, do you have any suggestions for how to bring that into the course? You know, yes. Whatever have you ever, I'm teaching, how do I start thinking about some of these things? Start bringing these ideas up. So yes. Have you ever uh, heard of James Nickel? Uh, Mathematics is God silent. Uh, Check that out. Uh, James actually created a curricula for high school students uh, on math. He's uh, he's brilliant mathematician, but his book, Mathematics Is God Silent, is an amazing book that deals with uh, baseline questions such as you're asking. Any other comments, questions? I'm glad this was recorded. Will we have access to it somehow? To I'm going to leave that up to Andy. OK. The short answer is yes. <laughs> I, I will send it to Richard and uh, Mark both, and they can distribute it. Or you can contact me, Joe. I can send it to you as well, Joe, if you'd like. Thank you. Anybody else? Comments, questions? Could I ask about your uh, your Dracula, your uh, your epic uh, moral stories? Yes. Uh, with Halloween coming up, I'm just a little intrigued by that. Uh, sure. Uh, actually, if you go to Warp and Woof and you type in uh, just the word Gothic, a whole bunch of essays will pop up and uh, I'll, I'll wax eloquent about one thing or another in those essays. Thank but you. quite frankly, I'll give you a short course of two <laughs> principles. Right. Uh, I believe that uh, gothic horror and horror generally as a genre is the closest genre to the Christian view of life and things. Number one, horror assumes the supernatural world. Horror assumes the supernatural world. And number two, horror assumes evil that must be defeated. It assumes evil that must be defeated. Gee, does that sound vaguely familiar? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Excellent, thanks. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Richard, for the opportunity to do this today. Thanks, Andy, for recording and for all the participants. It's been a great opportunity here this afternoon. Uh, grateful to do this. If, uh, if it, the opportunity ever arises again, Richard, I'll be happy to, to think about that again.
Okay, thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, let you, we will figure out a way to make this available to you. Um, we'll send, I'll send you an email with uh, the link uh, and I've sent it out to our whole mailing list. So those that were, uh, had a conflict and couldn't, couldn't participate today will be able to see it. We're also uh, hoping to find a way to make it available to professors at other universities. And you're certainly welcome uh, once you get the link to share it with your colleagues from other universities that you might interact with and you think would be interested in it. But uh, thank you for, for attending today and participating. Uh, we are planning one more webinar for this semester. Uh, Dr. Charles Ware uh, from Indianapolis, uh, he's involved uh, in an organization or a curriculum called Grace Relations. And uh, he's going to speak uh, about uh, racial uh, relationships and his perspective on that. So uh, right now, it looks like that'll be October 21st. I'll send out more information later, but thanks again for participating, and I think we'll sign off now. Thanks again.